Blackman. I saw we had a couple more join you are here for crisis leadership for the Pacific Division Institute. We are thrilled to have you. And uh, today you're going to be with me tomorrow. You will be with uh, the one and only Al Malamo. We've broken this workshop into two parts. The first uh, we're going to be talking about something called a, a concept called meta leadership. The second we will be talking about something called swarm leadership. What I would like to do, we've got about 49 folks on this evening. If you could in the chat, um, go ahead and put your region uh, where you're located. And um, if you could also put, uh, I asked a couple different questions each time we do this, but the, the question I'd like to start with tonight is, um, why are you here? And I'll go through those as we uh, as we get through our our training here. But let me um, let me just look and see who we've got here. This is fantastic. We might just have somebody from every region in the division. Wow, congratulations on the new gap. Yeah, good to see some familiar faces, absolutely. Got some folks here who've actually done this workshop before, some who were in our pilot group way back when, and some who are here just taking confidence builders to learn what we've got and what others have to offer, always ready to learn. How to be a good casework and recovery planning manager, fantastic. How to handle crisis in different times, how to gain leadership skills, deep interest in leadership. You can never have too much leadership. That's kind of true, isn't it? Last time we did this, we tried to do it in WebEx and everything crashed. And anyways, we had to we had to scramble and that was its own its own kind of a crisis there. More knowledge how it all works. I mean, took this with another division, so you'll get some. You'll get a little bit of a different flavor today, actually. Learning new skills, more effective around controlled chaos on a DRO. I like that, Bill. You and I have been through some controlled chaos. That is for sure. Crisis response team for your territory. Beautiful. All right, and keep. If you haven't put in, go ahead and put it. I'll keep. I'll keep looking through these as we go. And we'll load up the slides, and I think we should have slide number one up there, crisis leadership. I'm seeing it, meeting peers, perfect. All right, so today we are going to dive into the vast and deep world of crisis leadership and the decision making that goes along with leadership. Um, I see somebody, um, Renice put in the word crisis, got my attention. And that was, in some ways, that's a little bit deliberate on this one. Um, we're gonna talk about what crisis means, what leadership means, what happens when you put them together. Uh, the reason why we have this picture is that leadership is a lot like rowing. And here you've got two crew boats, crew shells, rowing out on a flat body of water. We've all come here with our own background and our own motivations. But at the end of the day, we have to unify around a mission uh, and a vision, and we have to move in, in seamless harmony. And rowing is all about that. If one person's off in a boat, you can literally get thrown out of the boat, get thrown around, and there's no way you're going to do well. Uh, and so someone, someone out of rhythm sticks out like a sore thumb, and that's going to slow the whole team down. But when we're in unison, it feels like the absolute easiest thing in the world. Uh, and so when, when we aren't, it, does, it, it feels like you're pulling the weight of the world. And so with that, with that introduction, we're going to go ahead and get into this. So our learning objectives. We have, we have two areas. One is conceptual and one is practical tonight. The first on the conceptual side, we're going to look at management versus leadership versus crisis leadership. Additionally, we're going to look at the purpose of a leader, and we're going to introduce two principles, meta leadership and swarm leadership. Since we've broken this up tonight, we're going to focus on meta leadership. And we've got some practical strategies. We're going to equip you with some strategies and some tools to aid in leading in a crisis. We are also going to put you into the hot seat of a crisis leader and exercise learned concepts. 
So this is not just going to be me talking. We're going to have two way. We're going to be in the chat. We're going to open up for actual sort of voice dialogue. Uh, the slide deck will absolutely be available. Tina, great question. Uh, right now we're going to we're just going to walk you through it uh, immediately after this. The slide deck will be available. Uh, and we're also going to have you do some writing and have you go through some exercises on your own. So management versus leadership. What's the difference? Does anybody want to, to uh, try and explain to the group and you can either put in the chat or you can come off mute uh, to talk about in your mind, what is the difference between management and leadership? Is there a difference? I'll speak up. <clears throat> Go ahead, Ryan. I think management is uh, <clears throat> refers to programs. Leadership refers to uh, personnel. I like that. Management being sort of programmatic, checking tasks off, leadership being about the people. Stephanie has management focuses on accomplishing the task. Leadership is on inspiring people to do it. Belinda says that leadership is often about inspiring the best out of others, taking responsibility and taking that initiative. Management is is can be seen more controlling. I would also argue leadership could also be quite controlling. But I think what we're getting is management is 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 more about getting it done, checking off boxes, one, two, three, four, five, following the steps. Cin uh, Cindy says uh, leadership is the vision. Management is more that execution. Mr. Dave Dyer says leadership is your tone uh, and the direction. Bill says the leader of the group isn't always the official manager. That's a great point, Bill, and that's one thing that we're going to get into. Now. So it, it, I, I think there's a consensus in the group that there is a difference. In the Red Cross, I would ask this question, do we care? Has anyone in the Red Cross, and I'm not asking to name names, has anyone worked for someone who is a fantastic leader, but perhaps not quite as great of a manager, or somebody who is a great manager and not quite as good of a leader? I'm getting yeses, lots of yeses. And Diane says yes to both, actually. And think about that, right? Just think back on that time. Whoever came to your mind first, think about what that meant and, and how that could have been a different interaction, right? How they could have been both a great leader and a great manager. Or maybe you've been in a situation where somebody, they know they're a good leader, they're not a great manager, but they've, they've supplemented themselves with a great manager right at their side or vice versa. Um, Alex has, has a good example here that they were promoted beyond their capabilities. We often talk about in a, in a crisis, we sort of rise to the occasion. And I would actually argue, and there's a lot of decision science, that you don't actually rise to the occasion, you fall to your greatest level of training and comfort and confidence. And so as we talk about the crisis side of things, we're going to see that there's a lot of snap decision making. And what we're going to have to get into is why does that happen? How do we work through those situations? How do we overcome those situations? And how do we move forward? <laughs> Bill says, had a few that were neither. And that's absolutely the truth, too. So what should a leader do? Um, go ahead and put in the chat if you can. One thing that you think is really important. I know a couple of people already put some of these in. But put one thing that you think a leader should do. If you're working for that leader or if you yourself are that leader. What should the leader do? Inspire, vision, listen. Oh, that's a huge one, Renise. Inspiring confidence, trusting in their team. I'm seeing trust a lot, leading by example, inspiration, modeling behavior, setting vision and direction, encouragement, clear communications, delegation, caring about your people, developing rapport and confidence. I don't know about you guys, but when, when I see these words, they're kind of, they're softer words, right? It's, it's a lot about, Think about the lemmings or the penguins, right? Sort of going off the cliff. Uh, a bad leader might be marching with everybody behind him, and they're the only ones who jump off the cliff and dive into the water. A good leader, the whole team follows, right? I'm not saying diving in this case is bad. Diving is a good thing. Respectful, empowerment, communication and listening, humility. These are really soft, um, soft orientation words. But I think that's a really important thing. As we went through this, we looked at and we talked with a bunch of different organizations and came up with uh, sort of these three things. Developing a shared vision, 
right? We, we saw the word vision come up a bunch of these messages here. A leader should develop a team around that shared vision and a leader should sustain the vision. And a lot of what we put in here, developing the rapport, confidence, showing interest, humility, communication, listening, empowerment, respect, knowledge, sense of humor, all of those things really feed into, in many cases, sustaining that vision. Now, what's crisis leadership? This is something if you go online and you try and do a search, you're not going to find a whole lot. Uh, a lot of this content that we got from this, we, we developed alongside the uh, United States Marine Corps with the folks at, um, at Harvard, a bunch of Red Crossers, a bunch of business executives, people in the, in the first response world, fire service, law enforcement, uh, emergency medical services. And we really wanted to try and get at the crux of what is crisis leadership. So here's, here's what we took a stab at. Guiding and inspiring others inside and outside of your organization while making high consequence decisions when you lack time, resources, information, or communication ability. The guiding and inspiring others, that's leadership, right? Inside and outside of your organization. We wanted to be very deliberate about that one because a lot of people look at leadership just with inside their organization. When you are in a crisis, especially in a crisis, your organization oftentimes may be the last thing you're thinking about because you're focusing, you're focusing outwards. The crisis piece is really where you are doing those high consequence decisions, that high consequence decision making process. You're lacking your time, your resources, your information or communication ability. Let's think about our future for a second. This is something working with the Institute of the Future um, they're, they're a group based out of, uh, out of Northern California, and they talk about something called VUCA, where the world that we live in is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Are there any of these four words that you really identify with? And when you, when you think about the world, that one of these jumps to mind for you. First one that came in fast was complex. I've got a bunch of uncertains, some ambiguous. Tina just says COVID-19, kind of hits it all, doesn't it? So when we, think about, when we think about the future and we think about crisis leadership, when we think about leading, when we think about crises, uh, we live in a volatile world. It feels like a powder keg sometimes. And the Red Cross is called on to respond in a whole bunch of different ways. And if any of you have spent time around an incident command post, or if you spent time in an operations center, or you spent time in a government briefing, the uh, addressing the crisis itself, the nature of the crisis, the threat, whether it's a fire, a flood, a hurricane, a tornado, a shooting, a volcano, the threat itself is generally pretty well contained. Even if even if the, the, the threat is not over, you know where the tornado was, you know where the hurricane's moving, you know that it will be over in two or three days. COVID is completely different, right? The, the, the idea of a public health threat of a pandemic in this case is something that doesn't have a fixed end time, doesn't have a fixed geography, it doesn't have a fixed demographic. It's affecting everybody all over the place. But with that, when you look at all of the different groups of people who are responding in a crisis, the human side is really messy, meaning it's, it, is, it is by definition complex. Most problems are human caused. And so when we think about crises and leadership, crisis leadership and a volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world, those who deal with the humans kind of have the toughest job. And when we look at our world, the world of mass care, preventing and alleviating human suffering, we are in the thick of this. So we've got to have a plan. We've got to be able to move forward. And this next slide, I love. So the boxer Mike Tyson famously said everyone has a plan till they get punched in the mouth. And when you think about a disaster, when you think about a crisis, COVID in this case, perhaps, that is that punch in the mouth. It's the thing that's going to throw your plan completely out of whack, up in the air, and you are the one caught standing there, tasked with it. Oh, yeah. Um, does somebody have something to share? I've got a question for the group. 
and you can either come off mute for it, or I should say raise your hand like calling you or go into the chat. Has anyone personally ever had an instance where you have had a plan, you've put together the plan, and then that plan went completely out the window, where you, in effect, got punched in the mouth with that plan? Parenthood. Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. Candace says most days. Kind of does feel like that, doesn't it? So in our world, I think we're going to be running into this a lot. If you haven't, welcome to it. That's the world of crisis. So what we're looking at is the crisis isn't going to go away. The volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, the ambigu ambiguity, that's going to be there. It's going to be there forever and ever and ever, and we're only going to get busier. So the question is, how do we become more adaptable? How do we roll with the punches? If you think about the analogy of a surfer and a wave, that wave is coming no matter what. And if you stand up to that wave, if you don't duck that wave, that wave is going to hammer you. Now, you learn a couple tricks. You learn how to dive under that wave. That's no big deal. You hold your breath and you come back out and you're ready for the next thing. And that's kind of what we're, what we're going to look through through the course of this workshop. So our two key concepts, tonight we're going to focus on meta leadership. Tomorrow we're going to focus on swarm leadership. Does anybody know what these four things are or any one of them? And I would say upper left is uh, something, upper right, lower left, and lower right. I see a B, absolutely. In the lower left, we've got a B. How about the upper ones? <laughs> Bugs. That's right, Lee. Liz. David, we've got an ant, absolutely. Ant in the upper left and a termite and that is it here we go. almost no we've got the termite the ant the bee and the human now what do these four have in common any ideas a colony teamwork survival swarm i see colony again they work in groups Yes, absolutely. Mass reproduction. That's true. These are the four most, according to the famous biologist E.O. Wilson, these are the four most cooperative species on the planet. Most species can communicate. Few cooperate. We, as humans, are the only ones that get to coordinate and collaborate. If you look at all the species that have lived on planet Earth, the most successful are ants, termites, bees, and people because they are the greatest cooperators. So we're going to get into with that, we're going to get into something called the four C's. I'm sure a number of you have heard of these. If not, we'll go through them just a, just a little bit. So we're starting at the top with the most simplistic and moving down to the most complex. Communication. This is simply just talking back and forth. Now, when we look at crisis leadership, crisis leadership is going to have us integrate all four of these together. So communication, that's just talking. We can, I'll, I'll pick somebody who, who I love to death, Anne, Anne Heresy. Anne and I can communicate, but we could hate each other. We don't, fortunately. We get along very, very well, but we could hate each other. We could still communicate back and forth. We could just scream at each other all day long. But let's go to cooperate. If we hate each other, it's kind of hard to cooperate. But cooperation is generally getting along with somebody but you could also kind of barter through cooperation, right? We may not like each other, but I give her something and she gives me something back. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of give and take relationship. Now, coordination. This is information sharing. This is having a dialogue. It becomes much harder to, to dislike somebody or to kind of grind along with them to really be able to coordinate. Collaboration, this is tough. This is the sweet spot when we talk about rowing in that world of swing. If you ever played sports, if you've ever been on a, just an amazing team or the best family vacation in the world where everybody's collaborating and you just swing, right? You could be doing the hardest thing in the world and it just flows. That's really what collaboration is. It's the top of the mountain. It's working together and really just clicking. So your vision in, in, in the world of, of collaboration, your vision and your outcomes are all pretty well aligned. So let's talk about meta leaders right now. Meta leaders seek to achieve results that cannot be accomplished by one organization, unit, or department in isolation. So it's five key concepts to meta leadership. And we're going to talk about this for a second. And then we're going to go into a couple examples. 
So achieving results that can't be accomplished by just one entity, right? So that's, that's our complexity right there. The second bullet, if you read that, linking efforts of numerous actors and many otherwise disconnected organizational units. So that's, it's not about just having multiple teams, it's about being intentional and it's about linking different actors. The third one here is operating without direct or explicit authority. And this one's really interesting. I think um, Bill or Dave may have mentioned up at the top is that the leader oftentimes may not be the person who's in charge, right? Because you sort of have that situational leadership where somebody just people want to follow that person. And that's really that third bullet point of meta leadership. The fourth bullet point is valuing the process and the output. It's not just about the results that we achieve. It's how we get to the results. If you look at a lot of the companies that have failed over time, one of the one of the bigger, uh, I'll call it blow ups recently, the company has not failed. But if you look at Uber, for example, their output was great productivity, great sales, great results, great you know earnings for their shareholders and for their investors. But the process created a very toxic culture in the company. A lot of people left. There was a lot of turnover, a lot of negative media and press and things started to go downhill. There are many other organizations where you start to see these kinds of examples where people sacrifice that process for the output. When you think about decision making in this context, in this case for meta leaders, a lot of times we just we, we, we sort of assume that the decision is how do I put it? That the decision yields the the, the truth, meaning if we were successful as a response, as a team, right? We achieved the goal, we got the flag to the top of the mountain. We're successful. Or we guessed that the storm was gonna go left. We're successful because the storm went left, we were right. But our whole process could have been screwed up backwards, um, broken, discombobulated, uh, poisonous. It could have destroyed the team in the process. And so, as we think about meta leadership, be thinking about your process and all of the inputs rather than just that one outcome. And here's the fifth one, getting out of the basement. And if you've if you've heard about meta leadership or taken a training before, you've probably heard this term, the basement. Now, what is the basement? The basement is a place that we all go to. It's a natural place. There's nothing wrong necessarily with going to the basement, but meta leadership meta leaders this is a this is a way for us to be deliberate be conscious and to think about ah am i going to the basement yes i am going to the basement hmm this isn't good the basement is think of going dark this is where you curl up into your caveman brain your caveman ball and you stop thinking properly we just talked about the four c's in the basement you can barely communicate effectively now if you can't communicate effectively do you think you can cooperate, coordinate, or collaborate? Probably not. So the basement is where you focus on yourself. You stop thinking about your team. You stop thinking about the situation. You stop thinking about the mission. And you also lose accountability. And so this is where you say, oftentimes, unfortunately, where you say the worst things and you make the worst decisions. Is there anybody who is willing to share an example of a time where they went to the basement? This is a safe space. I'll start. It was um, probably a dozen or 15, 20 hurricanes or so ago, and I was leading a team we were we were responsible for moving many many different things through uh, through a warehouse, and we had about sixty tractor trailers show up with the wrong product. I was tired. It was about one hundred ten degrees inside, and uh, there was a team that was late. We had a uh, great or seemingly great new team of event based volunteers, and. We weren't really clear in our instructions to this team and the team accomplished the task 
they got to the output, but completely got the process wrong. And we were packing things in boxes. And it turns out they packed not just the wrong thing, but things that would have blown up, not just in the Red Cross's face, but in the local government's face as well, and probably in the military's face. And I kind of lost it. Um, the team the, the team had mostly gone home uh, and there were a couple people around and I went to the basement. I was tired. I was angry. I was frustrated. Um, the I was overheated, dehydrated. I lacked calories. This was me going into my primal brain. And one thing I've learned over the years and, you know, 10 years or so since this incident um, and we, we, we worked through it and we, we got everything taken care of and, you know, sort of sorted everything back out with the team. But in that, in that moment, I failed as a metal leader. And since then, as I've learned this concept and really learned what the basement is and debrief with different mentors and tried to grow, learn and develop, I realized that that's exactly what it was. It was the basement. I went to it. And the key is realizing that it's natural and it's human for us to go to the basement. The genius, if we can work towards this, and as we're deliberate and as we support each other, and I know many of you serve as mentors for other people, is notice when you're going to the basement and check yourself. Or notice when your team member or somebody else's team member is going to the basement. And rather than making a big scene, and maybe they don't know the term basement, but hey, man, you seem, you seem a little bit overloaded, right? Maybe we just need to cool down for a second. And taking that strategic pause, taking that second to really break contact with the problem, clear your head, get exercise in, do some yoga, watch something funny on your phone, talk with your friends, call a family member, get some sleep, drink a gallon of water, whatever that is to get out of the basement. So that's an example of what the basement looks like. And that's also uh, an example of we're going to go there, but we've got to be we, we've got to be conscious of when we're going there and when others are going there. And it's our job as a leader to stop that process, disconnect from it, and do a little bit of a reset. Belinda, are you are you willing to share something? No, I, you know, I can't think of anything specific, but I, I mean, what I learned from that story reminds me a lot of like a Hurricane Sandy situation where mm -hmm. there was just... Um, so many people and so many goals, but there was just not enough resources. And you yourself are, in this case, it sounds like a piece of it was you yourself are not physically, mentally, emotionally able to handle that stress. Right. I can handle that level of stress and work through a problem if I've slept and I can, you know, work through things or a bunch of other pieces are pushed away from me so that I can just focus on this problem. But um, I, I think that our capacity to be able to handle that improves over time because when we've hit that wall, I think that you know where that is. And so I, I think if you're, if you're good at it, you, you're a little bit better at understanding um, where you are before you get there and say, hey, I can't do this by myself and I can't solve this by myself because I just, I can't, I don't have anything else to give. So. Mm -hmm. I want to say that going home and walking away and sleeping at, at that point, I don't think one time, one night of sleep is going to help, but, um, but it, it does know, it does help to know that place. Um, because you just realize that you just, you can't um, outthink your problem at that point because you're physically unable to do it. And yeah. yeah, so that I, I can't think of an example. It sounds really familiar. <laughs> yeah. Renee says, I time myself out more than my kids. Renee, amen to that. Um, Michaela says, develop a gut check, buddy, and help each other identify when it happens. That's a great thing. And it doesn't have to be one of your teammates. Um, it could be somebody you call. You know, it's your it's your phone a friend on who wants to be a millionaire. And it's like, oh, man, I'm going there. I better call him really fast. Um, and Alex says, every time I deploy, one goal is to make new mistakes because I'll eventually mess something up. But if I paid attention and learn anything, I won't make the same mistakes from prior deployment. Some people say it's like if you ski or ride bikes or water ski or, you know, some kind of sport or play music. It's if you're not uh, if you're not failing, then you're not pushing yourself. You're not learning. Now, the key here 
is not the, the mistake is not to be I'm going to go out and yell at a bunch of people and say, man, I should never yell at people again. The key is to catch yourself. And I think Belinda, as Belinda mentioned, there's and she hinted at, too, there's a over time as we do this more and more, we start to develop a gut feeling. And there's a great it's a it's a short read, maybe about 40. I think it's 40 pages or so. Uh, it's called How We Decide. And it's a, a book sort of uh, thesis on on the human brain, how it works, how we make decisions. And over time, the, the, the nervous system, the chemical synapses and what fires in our body move faster than our thoughts and our physical motor reactions. So when you have been on a bunch of different operations or you've worked a bunch of wildfires or typhoons, um, you start to develop those gut feelings as you do in any other kind of thing. Oh, this isn't good. This is bad. And it comes the same thing with with being in the basement of if you can develop that gut feeling of, oh, this isn't a good place to be. Sometimes your, your gut, your stomach really does feel unsettled. Then what you start to run into is you realize, hmm, I'm going there. Yep, not today. Barbara mentions, I know I usually hit the wall at some point, and now I can see when that's coming a little bit better than you used to. Lau says, about day eight, I need time to rest or I get short with people and feel ill. And one thing, again, with, with these confidence builders, with this workshop, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to make you a black belt in meta leadership tonight or tomorrow. But this is an opportunity to be deliberate about how we think, how we act, to evaluate and, and revise our decisions and our habits. Habits are huge in all of this. And so to, to Lau's point about day eight, is there a way that we could stretch that perhaps, or maybe that happens or we start to catch it on day 14, or can we develop better habits throughout a response? Because almost nothing that we do in the Red Cross requires a five second split decision. Do I push the red button or not? All right, we have, we have time to get through those things. And so are there habits that you can form and think about as we're talking uh, this evening, write down on a piece of paper, what are what maybe what are some of your habits on a relief operation? And are they good habits or are they bad habits? The more that you can form those good habits, the more that you can change and adjust your gut feeling, the more that you can either delay going into the basement or realize that you are in that basement, thus becoming a better meta leader. Michelle asked the author of How We Decide, and the author of How We Decide is, I'll pull it up as we're going here. Let's go to the next slide while well, that's loading for me. Renee, sometimes I don't see it coming, but my manager does and tells me to take some time off. And that's really where it comes to looking out for each other. Um, the author of How We Decide is Jonah Lehrer, and I'll put, uh, I'll put that. There we go. I'll put that into the chat. Thanks, Michaela. So let's go to meta leadership. What is this and what does it mean? In the center is the person, that's you. We then need to think about the situation. So here's me, me, myself, and I. The situation is whatever I'm responding to. And then there's connectivity, connectivity to the broader world and how myself, how the situation, how we interact, and how others and other teams and other influencers affect me, affect the situation. Put most simply, and if there's anything I want you to walk away with this from after this evening, is to think beyond your normal or standard comfort zone. Now, a lot of times, let me ask this, and we'll, we'll put it in the chat. When you think about on a relief operation, just put the first thing that comes to mind. There's not a right answer. Which person, team, or organization does the most interaction or at interacting with external partners? People not in the Red Cross. Go ahead and put it in the chat. I've got Carol and Betsy with external relations. I've got a government operations. Ah, I've got casework. I've got community partnerships. I have feeding and I have mass care, in-kind donations, more community partnerships, public affairs, sheltering, mental health. Lucky and right are not the same thing. That's true. More external relations. Ah, ambassadors, health services. 
spiritual care. Now, as I look at most people on here and I look at their gaps, many of you are putting the thing which you are most or with which you're most comfortable. The mental health people are saying mental health, spiritual care people are saying spiritual care, the logisticians are saying you know, facilities or in-kind donations. The external relations people are saying elected official liaisons, government operations, community partnerships. So this is the world that we know, right? And depending on where you sit, I think the answer is everybody's interacting with external teams, players, partners, organizations. Meta leadership is a way for us to be deliberate. Think of it as a cheat sheet. You go in the field and you've got this with you. We talk about practical tips and tricks. We're going to focus on four different dimensions as part of meta leadership. So there's leading up. That's your chain of command. That's your direct boss, your supervisor. There's down. That's your team, the people who report to you, the event-based volunteers, the AmeriCorps, the service associates, could be the supervisors, could be the managers, depending on where you sit, the people down below you in the chain of command. Then we have a cross. So we're up, down, and across. Across are or is different teams within the Red Cross, still internal to our organization. So if you are in facilities, across might be your mass care teammates, or it could be your external relations teammates. Beyond would be entities, teams, organizations, activities outside of the Red Cross, beyond the Red Cross walls that we have to interact with. So the four are, if we were in person, we do a little chant together, but it's up, down, across, and beyond. Those are the four, and we're going to come back to those. Does anybody recognize this picture or where they think it might be from? That's that trail in Sonoma County. It is definitely a trail close to Sonoma County. Hillary says Walmart. Absolutely. Campfire. A little bike path is a campfire. Absolutely. This is a picture of uh, right outside of a Walmart known as the Walmart parking lot. You may have heard that up in Chico, California. And what do you see here in this picture? People sheltering themselves independently. Absolutely. Tent City. Homelessness, organization, maybe self organization. There's a lot going on in this picture. Community. That's a great point. Definitely community. Teamwork. Yeah. There's probably some teamwork going on here. David hits it on survival as well. People doing what they have to do to survive. People are going to do what they need to do. Our job is to alleviate that suffering. In some cases, we may help aid or, or, or foster survival. No question about that. That's what shelter is. Without shelter, you don't last very long in the elements. So we're going to do an exercise here as a group. Uh, and this is time if you've got pen and paper, you've got your iPad, you've got your laptop, you've got some other tablet, your phone a place to take notes. So you're going to be asked to deploy to a fire in Northern California as the site director at a local fairgrounds. The stakes are very high and there are many stakeholders. Now, I want to say, number one, this is a safe space. This is a chance to practice. So there are no wrong answers here. And also that you might not be gapped as somebody who can be a site director. You may not want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. Well, today we're going to touch it and you're going to touch it real close and personal. So you're going to be that site director and you may never want to be one. But the reality is, as we talked about that, who, which, which activity deals with external partners. And I think everybody put whatever gap you are. There's a very high chance that you will find yourself in a position one way or another where you will do something similar to site directing. It might be a very small site. It might be an activity. It might be a project, but you're going to be directing that site. And there's a chance that you're going to be interacting with lots of other partners. We want you to be ready for when this happens, and we want you to rise to this occasion. So as the site director today, you will be initiating operations at the fairground. You are going to get a briefing on the situation, the layout, and some of your constraints. Listen to the briefing and capture the key relationships that you need to build and maintain. 
Now, what do you, how do you think we're going to categorize those relationships? Four different areas. We just went over them. Up, down, across, and beyond. That's how you're going to categorize these relationships. Later, you're going to be asked to assess your strengths and weaknesses and possible vulnerabilities based off of this one-time briefing. I'm going to suggest that if you aren't a fast writer or typer, maybe you find a different way to capture the information. You will only get this briefing once, and it cannot be slowed down. So take a moment to get settled, get your listening ears on, get comfortable in your seat, grab pen and paper, grab your notepad, whatever it is, and here we go. Welcome to the operation. I need you as the site director on scene at Silver Dollar Fairgrounds tomorrow morning. We are consolidating from four shelters and a parking lot into this big shelter. We expect about 500 clients indoors across three separate buildings. We're right next door to the Costco and a 7-Eleven in the center of town. There are a few bars and restaurants right across the street. The county will manage the security contract but the fairgrounds are state property. So California Highway Patrol has jurisdiction, not the Chico Police Department and not the sheriff. The fairgrounds are in Butte County, but the biggest city in Butte is Chico. Chico has very low rental housing stock and the fairgrounds are next to the unincorporated parts of town. We expect about 100 clients from the nearby Walmart to move over to the fairgrounds on the day that we consolidate. They will all likely stay in tents on the property and they're bringing their own tents, so we think. We expect about 150 RVs. The fairgrounds have a manager and he reports to the fair board. The only people who can boss around the fair manager are the folks on the fair board. For mass care, you've been working with the Butte County Social Services Director most closely. This will be the first shelter in the center of town. I'm worried about opiate drug usage with clients. There's an elementary charter school co-located on site at the fairgrounds. It took us so long to open up the fairgrounds because this site was the Cal Fire base camp until yesterday. And we only got word today that they had completely moved out. You'll need to accommodate pets, and we've located a building on site that should work for a pet shelter. Verizon and T-Mobile want to help with connectivity. There are a few nonprofits that want to offer laundry service on site with portable washing units, but you've never worked with these groups before. The state is supplying the accessible shower and toilet facilities. We've had a norovirus outbreak in each one of our shelters. So there will be California state medical assistance teams operating isolation facilities on premises. There are about 40 medically frail patients in your general client population. We advise that you initiate a curfew because we did that at previous shelters and it worked really well. If you end up having tents outside, they will have to be about 400 yards away from your main gate. There are three lots for RVs at the fairgrounds with a total capacity for 120 RVs. We've been told that we can only have the fairgrounds for the next three weeks because they've got a wedding booked on site coming up. We know you'll do a great job. Good luck. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to give everybody five minutes to categorize the relationships that you heard in that briefing across the four areas. Up down, across, and beyond. So categorized by those four relationships, and I'm gonna go ahead and give you five minutes. So it's 7.45 right now in California, and we will go until 7.50. Five minutes, categorize those relationships, up, down, across, and beyond.
Betsy asked a good question about the difference between across and beyond. Across are other teams within the Red Cross that you're going to have to work with. Beyond are organizations or teams outside of the Red Cross with whom you have to work. OK, we've got 750 here in California, so let's get back to it. So what I'd like to do is debrief the different relationships that you capture. And we're going to start with up. Now, you're the, the site director in this case. Would anybody like to share what they had as the up relationships? Uh, the doc, absolutely. They might be calling you. Your division disaster director. Yeah. Uh, let's see, the job director and the deputy job director. We have the assistant director of operations. Absolutely. The DRO director, the doc again. The Red Cross coordinating officer. Very good. RCCO, that's it. Any others that people had? Got the disaster operations coordination center again. Yeah, so I think I think the thing to mention here and, and to really hammer home is that up relationship. When we focus on meta leadership, when we focus on thinking beyond ourselves and just our situation, there are many people up the chain of command who we might have to work with who are going to be affecting our lives, our clients' lives, how we work, how we interact. And so it's not just about your direct boss and supervisor. You've got to manage up to many different, many different people within the organization. I've got a couple people jumping to some of the beyond relationships outside of the Red Cross, even though they might be high on the totem pole on the chain of command, they're outside of the Red Cross. So I'm going to put those as beyond relationship. The VP of operations, the vice president of disaster operations and logistics. Absolutely. So more, again, different senior folks within the Red Cross. Now, how about down? We just did up. How about down? Any of the down relationships that we have to manage? Shelter teams, yep, and multiple shelter teams. We might have multiple facilities, could be inside and outside, that's it. Shelter manager, caseworkers, feeding, different activity managers, yes. Um, staffing facilities, functional team leads, health services, mental health, another more for feeding. So what we have here, it's not just your direct reports, right? Already I've listed way more than seven, and we talk about span of control being one to seven seven direct reports being ideal, many more people in those down relationships than our direct reports. And so it's not just about maybe that morning briefing you have with your team. There's a whole bunch of other people out there that you've got to make sure as a meta leader that you're communicating with, that you're coordinating with, you're cooperating with, and you're collaborating with. Disability integration, that's going to be a big one. Reunification, Brenda hit that nail on the head. David with distribution of emergency supplies. 
So all kinds of different people in this facility. One of the reasons why we picked a fairground is because it is a little mini city with all kinds of different things going on in it. And so we wanted to hit that level of complexity. What about notifying the chain of command? Or what about chain of command with notifying all of these other functions? That's a great, great question uh, that Betsy asks. Chain of command is really in, in place to assure our, our authorities, right? Our accountabilities and our responsibilities. Chain of command doesn't necessarily mean that you only communicate with the people who are directly above or directly below you. When we, when we look at what's required for communication, coordination, cooperation, and collaboration, you're going to have to think of, regardless of your role, you're going to have to think of many different ways to work with those team members and those teams to make sure everybody's gelling, to make sure everybody's communicating. Um, somebody here had it, M Michaela hit it on formal versus informal communication. We talk about that in concept of operations, right? There's there's specific ways and, and times and tools we use to check in with people. And then there's a lot of informal stuff. How many of you have just walked the grounds or walked the facility, walked the premises to just talk to people, to learn what's going on, to sort of see what the pulse is? It's not about the badge and the big media or press tour that comes with you. It's about getting to know the teams and seeing what's happening on the ground. One mantra that, that I bring with me everywhere I go and when, when thinking about crisis leadership is if you don't go, you don't know. And this is extremely true on, on operations. How many times have you worked with someone? I hope it's few, but I know some who've worked with many. How many of you have worked with someone who never left the office? Right, or they never left their desk or they never left their cubicle. Now, that's not to say that you need to be out in the field in the trenches as the job director or something. But what it gets to is there, there are multiple different ways, given the technology that we have, that you can go without physically going. And this is going to become increasingly important, vitally important in the COVID world. We're going to have more people who are back who are supporting virtually. You're going to be in a leadership position. You're going to say, well, Luke, you just, you know, Luke told me if I don't go, I don't know. And I can't go because we're doing this virtual. So therefore, I don't know. Think about all the different tools that you have in your tool belt to go virtually. Could somebody take pictures for you, record video, FaceTime you in or do a WhatsApp video call or maybe even put on Microsoft Teams, FaceTime, right? You could take your laptop here pulling up Microsoft Teams and you could get your whole team together talking with the one person who's on the ground. You have the Microsoft Teams app. You can engage with them virtually right there, chatting with them. I do it all the time. So be thinking about different ways to go, especially when it comes to those down relationships. And we'll also see about some of the across and some of the beyond as well, where it's not about walking 10 feet across and communicating with somebody. We're going to have to get a little bit more creative. Now let's talk about some of the across relationships that we have. This is still within our organization, but not directly within our chain of command. What are some of the across relationships? LSAP and logistics, maybe that AD of logistics, absolutely. External relations, that assistant director or, or just some of the external relations teams. Public information officer, um, maybe it's our staff health or staff wellness person. Elected official liaisons, these are Different teams, not necessarily on site. They're not reporting up to me. These are our cross relationships within the Red Cross. Absolutely, you're hitting all of them. Planning, oh, absolutely planning. They're not just there to bug you and get your day, get your information and reports. They actually can really provide you critical, valuable intelligence on the ground. And they can also make your life a lot easier, help you track your teams, help figure out where everything is. No question about that. Now, let's go to maybe the richest of all of these, the most complex, the most involved, the most chaotic potentially. What are some of the beyond relationships outside of the Red Cross that you captured? Sharon says the fairgrounds manager. Absolutely, you better believe it. Social services, FEMA, Salvation Army, Highway Patrol, the fair board. Great catch there, Ryan. David says the police, right? That's law enforcement, could be security, absolutely. We've got county and state resources, the elementary school on site, maybe that principal. Verizon and T-Mobile, Michelle, great catch there. Liz, 
city and county officials, right? Just because someone says they're in charge, they may not actually be. They may not, they may be politically out, they might have a week left in their position, or they may not legally have the authority. So trying to figure out those relationships is going to be really important for you. Pet shelter partner, Barbara, great catch there. Our donors, potentially, you could have almost any client who walks up or any partner who walks up to the Red Cross could become a donor, whether it's a donor of time, a donor of dollars, a donor of influence, uh, medical, all of those medical teams that are on site, and says Walmart. That's a great point. We've got a, uh, working with Walmart to transition those clients safely, securely, respect their privacy, all of those different things. David talks about the firefighters, right? We talk about a good hello and a good goodbye. That uh, the Cal Fire teams are hopefully going to have a good goodbye. We have to have a good hello with them as they're leaving and continue to work with them. Hillary hits on the school facilities person. So it's not just the principal, it's not just the parent teachers association, but the person who really knows they've got the keys, they know where the gates are, they know how things open. Diane talks about the pharmacies and the stores that are right around the corner. Absolutely. Why bring medication from all the way, you know, across state or across town or across the country? Maybe we've got it right next door. Diane, yep, pet sheltering group, absolutely. How, how strong is the relationship with them? How long can they last on the ground? Kathy hits on Costco and 7-Eleven. Those are going to be corporate partners right around the corner. They also happen to be donors in some cases for us. Belinda talks about the RV board, right? All of those RVs, they're going to have their own take on the world. They may not understand what life is like for a person in a tent or a person in the shelter. Dave talks about the Department of Social Services. They're going to be a huge partner for us. They can provide teams. They can provide people. Candace talks about media. The media just might show up, and you may be the right person at the wrong time, right? You're standing there, and that camera's in your face. That media crew wants to talk to somebody, and you're it. Liz talks about the homeless agencies. Absolutely. Case working. You know, people experiencing homelessness have got a lot of different social workers, a lot of different resources, a, a very different community, uh, and a lot of different agencies are going to be wanting to work with us. Narita talks about groups willing to do laundry, more partners coming in to help take some load off of our back who can really help us out. Carol talks about warehouses and realtors. Barbara on transportation partners and options for clients. No question about that. Uh, Belinda hits on a good one. I think it's the first I saw this one, the wedding. What about that couple that's getting married? The reason why we've got to be out of the fairgrounds. Let's see what else. Boad therapy dogs, dump sites for the RVs. Absolutely. If you don't think about that issue, you might not be a logistician, but somebody may come by and they say, well, do, do you need me to dump these RVs? You don't know? Keep them there? Go ask that person or go ask your facilities person or your logistics person or Google it. Try and figure out what's going on because you don't want RVs filling up on your property and you don't want them dumping behind the corners. So all of these organizations that fit into this beyond category are critical for us, critical partners. And the thing is, when we talk about meta leadership, why are we digging into all of these different organizations and these different relationships? It's not just that you might find yourself in this situation and we want you to be prepared for it. And again, this is a safe space for us to practice and learn and get the answers wrong or whatever, not that there's really many wrong answers. But there's also the level of complexity and learning as meta leaders, how do we deal with this complexity? How do we deal with all of these different things? So. I'll ask one question before we go to the next slide. When you look at this at the sheet, or as you were thinking through, were there any relationships, any beyond relationships that surprised you, that caught you off guard, that you never in a million years would have thought were, were people we needed to form relationships with? Uh, thrift shop HOAs, yeah. People across the street, homeowners can be many pains in the butt or they can be your best friends, it depends. Tent camping clients, yeah, that may not be something you've run into, especially in this COVID world. That is something that is more and more likely for us as people want to avoid those congregate shelters and try and stay close-knit with their families. Bars, yeah, you may not think that that bar owner is going to be a partner, but they might be. Airbnb. Yeah, are they, you know, where, where, where do they fall? The PTA, that's probably not an organization you work with too often, 
But when you think about who wields power in a community and who can really get on your nerves, who can make your life easy, who can make it difficult, who can be a great partner, who can rally the community, the PTA is a fantastic partner, or they can be. So part of this, and part of the, the reason we want to dive into this, is to is to help you focus on how we can proactively think about these types of relationships. Because what often happens and what, what we see on relief operations and what the feedback we got as we were putting together this, this workshop was that we really only think about some of these organizations when things go wrong, right? Oh, so-and-so is complaining and now we've got to deal with this problem. What if we were being proactive about that from the beginning? How could that have changed the course of our, of our operation or of our relationships? Tina, do you have a question? I do. Uh, I put the tent camping clients. It's a beyond. Does that are you saying that they are organized as a group or, you know, I can see us dealing with the client as mm -hmm. tent dwellers, as clients, individual clients. Are we saying that the tent camping clients are organized and then we have to deal with that? That's a great question. Here? I I wouldn't. Well, I, I wouldn't assume that they are necessarily an organized group. However, one thing that you see with humans, the longer that, that a group of people congregate in one place, the more that they start to form a group, an affiliation or an organization. So you might very well find that the group elects one person to work with you as the, as the site director uh, to talk about their complaints, their grievances, their problems. Now they're kind of a group. Uh, it might be you're working with with, you know, you're working with one or two clients, but you realize you need to brief all of the clients uh, and you can't just rely on talking to one or two people. And so in that case, your behavior, your interactions might might adjust for it to be more of a group type dynamic than individual client dynamics, especially because people are going to be in those tents, kind of like the RVs, too, where it's not like you can just say, hey, everybody get together, especially in the covid world where you're not congregating a bunch of people around in a circle and getting on a bullhorn and talking to them. So they 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 may not be an official group, but they can start to uh, exhibit or exemplify some of those group like behaviors. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that's great. So what I'd like to do. Is next we're going to talk about how you might track the status or the condition of your relationships. And so just writing them down doesn't necessarily do you much good. You can track them each day. Uh, and here's an example of a relationship tracker. If you're an external relations, you might do this yourself. Maybe you've done this in other activities. Maybe you've never done this and never seen it before. What we wanted to do is, as we said at the beginning of this, we wanted some practical and we also wanted some functional tactical applications and tools and tricks. Um, think of it as tools for your tool belt. And so regardless of your role, be thinking about the different kinds of organizations or teams, personnel, up, down, across, beyond, who you might have to interact with, especially those beyond relationships. And what you have here in this example is you have types of organizations or groups in the left column, the relationship, and on the right-hand side, the status or any issues that might pertain to this partner. And we picked a simple red, yellow, green, or red, amber, green, uh, depending on how you like to call it. I think of a stoplight, so I say red, yellow, green. Green is good, yellow is okay, red is bad. This is a really easy way for you to understand and see. Imagine if we had 40 rows here of partners, somebody on the team was categorizing uh, where their pain points. And where you see those reds, those might be the things that you need to jump on right away. And the yellows, now we have some agency, now we have some ability to affect those relationships, drive them back into the green, keep them from going to red. So we're not constantly putting out fires. And now our day is just going around interacting, talking with people. It's not running around, letting our hair on fire and being a part of the problem. Now we are leading through the crisis rather than responding or reacting to the crisis. Here's another example, another way of looking at it. So rather than perhaps the names of the organizations the, or, or groups, maybe you want to do it by activity. It could be by functional area. Uh, some of our logisticians may may see these columns and you know have flashbacks to this, but you know your neighbors, client satisfaction, health, your budget, your staffing pipeline, life safety, NASA protection, LSAP, right? Could be water sanitation and hygiene or uh, RV cleanout. Whatever whatever makes sense for you and your situation. You can still go by the red, yellow, green, 
capture some of the issues that you have. And then maybe here in that right column, we added a column where you could talk about some of the partners who need to be engaged in that activity or that functional area who can affect that status. So when we talk about water sanitation and hygiene, in this case, we have both fairground management and the septic vendor, the person who's gonna pump the tanks out. They both need to be involved in those, in those collaborations and those decision-making processes. So another way of looking at that tracker. All right, so here's where we are now. Back to a, a functional exercise. It's now the end of day one, and you've taken full command of the area. You're now on the radar of, surprise, surprise, national headquarters. And it turns out your operation, your facility, and you are the center of gravity for the country. Happened just like that. You're going to have to brief the vice president of operations and logistics and, surprise, surprise, the Red Cross CEO on your situation. Why is that? Well, it turns out they're coming out tomorrow morning. And they're going to come out and they're going to walk the site with you because if you don't go, you don't know. And they want to hear from you what's going on. So I'm going to give you five minutes to prepare a brief. This is not bullet points. This needs to be a coherent brief that flows. And I want to remind you, this is a safe space. And for those who are willing, I'm going to ask you to share your brief if you would like. So here are the objectives of our brief that I want you to hit on as you as you scramble and write furiously for five minutes. What do you think will be your top five relationships that you need to manage and why? And what do you think will be your three biggest site or relationship specific challenges? So your top five relationships that you think you're going to need to manage and why? And what do you think will be your three biggest site or relationship specific challenges? And if you've never written a brief before, and I know some of you have and some of you haven't, here's some tips. I won't read these, but I'll leave these up while we work. So it's now 8.10. We're going to go until 8.15 to prepare the briefs, and then we'll come back and we'll see if anyone's willing to share. Again, you're not meant to completely finish this brief. It's just to get it started. And for those who are willing, we'll have you share. So 8.10, we'll get back together at 8.15. Alex asked a good question. The move to the fairgrounds has been completed. Yes.
That's a great question. When I say briefing, is this the same structure for a sync call? Um, the traditional sync has got a little bit more of a, a firm structure right now, uh, but it's very possible this structure here is a very helpful structure for a sync call. So if you're thinking about, hey, maybe I want to do a sync one day, or I've got a sync with the division or with our regional leadership team, this structure will do you very well in a sync call. We actually worked with with the doc on on this suggested structure and some of these tips. Great question. Good question, David. Is there norovirus? There's certainly a good potential. We've just completed the move. We may not know. We may not have some of the the, the uh, patient count at this point, but uh, there's a very high chance of, of transmission. All right, it's now 8.15 in California. So let's talk about um, this briefing. Is there anybody who would like to share their briefing as they've prepared? And if so, I'd ask you to come off mute and to turn your camera on. But first, if you'd like to share, go ahead and raise your hand uh, so I can do it in order for folks. And remember, this is a safe space. This is an opportunity for us to practice. I think I see a hand. Uh, Dave, you want to go ahead and start us off? Certainly, let me get you on the video there. Yes, sorry about the light gotcha, there. Got you clear. All good. You yeah, look great. Anyway, uh, my name is Dave Dyer, site manager at the Silverdar Fairgrounds. Uh, good morning. I just want to give you a quick update. I would like to give you the bottom line up front, and maybe my staff can follow up and give you more detail. But the bottom line up front is our, our primary main challenge is working with the uh, the fair manager, fairgrounds manager in the, in the uh, and the board there, they're they're not on board with us helping at the site and, and giving us the facilities we need. And so there's going to be uh, some activity going on with the uh, the SOC or State Emergency Operations Center, focusing on uh, possible assistance from the state or the governor to acquire that property for the need of this disaster. And so that's the big upfront bottom line that to be tracking. Uh, the relationships, the main relationships are, like I said, the fairgrounds folks, uh, management, and also the Department of Social Services. They're key to all the players and making things happen in that community. They're, they're, a, they're a big, big player there. And uh, I will let, I'll pause and let you uh, bring in the other staff people to maybe follow up. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dave. Well done. Uh, if, if folks could in the chat, what, what are one of the two of the things, uh, we'll go, we'll go to the next person. What are one or two things that you that you really liked or caught your eye about Dave's briefing? Yeah, lots of thumbs up. Nice job, Dave. Succinct. That's a great one. And I think, Dave, you, you really hit the nail on the head where some people may say, well, you know, we need to have more information or whatever it is. But it's always great to pause for questions, figure out what they what they want to know. He shared the that bottom line up front shared some challenges right away, it was clear about his concern, brought those concerns forward, deferred to other staff. That's a big one too, right? You empower your staff, you let the subject matter experts talk about what they know. Great points across the board, Dave, well done. And I think I see another hand, let me look for it. Belinda, do you wanna go ahead? So I don't have all these numbers here, but it gives you an outline. Um, hi, my name is Belinda. I'm the site director. We opened two or three days ago and we moved in from so-and-so location. Currently, the site houses 500 souls spread throughout three buildings. Um, the major services that are being provided on the site is a sheltering feeding, 
um, client services. Um, uh, of the clients that are here, the, the major category statistics, I was just, just to give you a sense of what this community is like, is you know the average age is this, da da da, disability, income, problems faced, um, and uh, so these are the and and so the and obviously I, I'm not used to giving presentations. So, but yeah, and something along this line, services being provided. I, I also think that um, I'm sure you you have some background in into what's been happening in in the disaster right now. Currently, we're at this phase of the of the situation, and we're providing these services. Um, so, and and we're working on this solution um, as, as things develop. So major issues we have on the site that we're currently working through, um, there is a, a norovirus outbreak and we have uh, measures that are being taken. Um, there is a necessity to move out in three weeks. Um, what is unusual about the site is that we have um, RV parks and tents, and that is adding some complication to the way that we work with clients is a little bit different from how we're working with, you know, typical shelter. Um, so that's adding a lot of complication. And we also have a large homeless population working working through this um, this area. Um, our major uh, relationships that have been very supportive of us is the county and the city primarily, and uh, the state has been providing help as well in um, in helping us provide some resources. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Very, very nice. Thank you, Belinda. Georgia asked a great question, and Belinda, you hit on something a little bit different than Dave, and I think you both did this really, really well, but you took different approaches. Georgia asked a question, of, should this type of briefing give specific numbers? And Belinda, I think it was great that you sort of, you save space, right? You would have had the numbers in real life, but you save space for what some of those numbers are. And I think one of the, the really nice things, and Belinda, I've, I've seen you do this uh, in, in person before, is write down the numbers. You don't have to have them memorized per se and maybe have your team get them to you ahead of time. A nice thing that you could do is maybe have some of them printed out or written down that you can share with the people you're briefing, right? When we talk about meta leadership and we're in the middle of crisis, things are happening really fast and they may have two or three minutes. They may, they may be in the basement themselves. If you can give them a little takeaway or a handout, now they're going to remember what you said because they're going to be staring at it. Anybody want to put in the chat? I think we've got time for one more uh, if somebody's willing, but some of the stuff, um, some of the, uh, if anybody wants to share one or two things they liked about Belinda's uh, briefing. Accentuate the positives first. Yeah, that was a great, that's a great thing. Yeah, lots of thumbs up on that one. Nicely done. Anybody else want to share? Um, bah, bah, bah. Anybody else want to share their briefing? or share where they were, maybe even share something you struggled with. And this is a safe space, there are no wrong answers. All right, not seeing any hands, so we'll go ahead to the to the next piece. If we were in, actually I might have a hand now. Bill, you wanna go ahead and share? We've got time for Mr. Bill Hart. Sorry, I just lowered my hand just as you were saying that, but you caught me. Well, welcome to DR 999-2020. If there's anything you need, please see this fellow over here after the briefing and he'll be happy to help you. I'm Bill Hart, the site director here at our Silver Dollar Fairground Cellar site. And as with all Red Cross activities, the safety and welfare of our staff is our top priority. But we're also giving additional priority to working with our county and state partners to further control the outbreaks of the norovirus. New sanitation and hygiene controls seem to have greatly reduced new cases. We met with the administration of the co-located co school, and we've arranged to present some Pedro and some pillow, cla pillow case classes. And it's been agreed that this will go a long ways towards calming the children's fears. We've also up We've also been working closely with our, the nearby bars and restaurants, as well as the HOAs, to preempt any issues that may become associated with the in, expected influx of homeless clients. And our biggest challenges remain first a norovirus outbreak, which we feel is being handled adequately. 
We also have some concerns regarding security in the RV and tent populations. And LSAP has been coordinating the private security and CHP on those issues. Are there any questions that I can answer before we begin our tour? Great ending on that one, Bill. I think that was great. You gave them a soft, sort of a soft toss into a tour where there's going to be more dialogue and even even inviting them to a tour. Some people may expect it. Some people may want to go on their own. But if you open that door to walk with them, you kind of control the situation a little bit more. Not saying you're only going to show them the good parts of what's going on, but you can shape the narrative a little bit. You also open with a couple of the different innovative things that I really that I think is really powerful of what your team's trying to do. They'll remember that. Uh, very well done. Any any other thoughts on uh, what Bill shared? Yeah, Alex says great job with the pillowcase project. I think that's a great throw. That's an easy win for us with a partner. Easy thing to do. Being proactive. That's a great one. Talked about his main concern of children on site, as 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 Belinda did as well. I think that's a really nice that's a really nice catch. What that means is. The, the the leadership team or whoever's coming, right, those partners, they're not going to expect you to have all the problems solved. They're not going to expect you to have all the numbers, but you're being honest about what you know and what you don't know, and you're being genuine. Um, you take some of those negatives and flip them to positive. So very well done. If we were in person, we would have done this, and what we would have done is we would have everybody pick a partner, and we'd be doing a briefing back and forth so everybody would get a chance to go. If you've got a friend who's on here, or if, if you just as a over the next couple of days, uh, take a chance, find a find a Red Cross buddy and see if there's see if they'd be willing to let you give them your brief. Um, the more we do this, the more it's going to lower the blood pressure, the more it's going to just make you feel a little bit calmer, because at some point you'll have to brief somebody. And the more chances we get to do this, actually voicing it, not just in front of the mirror, but to somebody else um, can really help you build some of these competencies. Michaela says, I like a briefing that includes what we know, what we don't know, and then where we're trying to go and how we're addressing the things that we don't know, um, and then you know where they can get more information. So we're coming up on the end, but we've actually got one more activity. We talked about, again, over and over again, we talked about tools in the tool belt. And this is something, um, uh, the, the Eisenhower decision matrix. Some of you I know have, have worked with this and played with it. Some of you have a lot of experience with this. This is not something we're saying you have to do, but when it comes to managing as a meta leader, leading as a crisis leader, getting through the day can be a lot. It really can be. So what, we, what we'd like you to do with this tool for the tool belt is a way to help manage uh, some of the different things that are coming in, all of that flow and just that onslaught of stuff. Because through better management, we can become better leaders. We can focus on those things, the vision, sustaining the vision, leading the team and sharing the, 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 the vision with our team. And so if you could, wherever you're taking your notes, um, put these four boxes. So there's do, decide, delegate, and delete. And, and the do and the delegate are basically things that are urgent. The deciding and deleting, these are things that are not necessarily urgent for you in your role right now. Then you have the top row, which is what's important to you in your role. And then things that are not important to you in your role. So go ahead and put those four boxes, pretty simple and straightforward. And then what we'd like to do is we're going to flip to the next slide that's going to show you 15 different injects. They're going to come and fly at you very, very fast in your role as this site director. And as a meta leader, you're going to have to think through how do we manage this complexity? How do we lead through the challenge and how do we adjust our plans? So take a look at this 15. I'm not going to read them. And go ahead and start putting them into boxes. And if you find there's anything that you're putting in the delegate box, go ahead and put that number in the chat. If there's anything you think that you're going to be able to delegate, go ahead and put it in the chat. Whatever that number is.
Michelle, I think I'm still sharing. I'm not sure why you're not seeing the slide here. But I can get you, Michelle, and we share the, the, the stuff. I'll make sure this is slide 21, Michelle, um, so you can take a look at it. I see a lot of number one, number two. Carol had three, eight, and ten. Yeah, and I know we had we had a confidence builder on delegation earlier, and that's a that's a big one. One of the one of the areas, one of the reasons why we go to the basement is that overload, right? Sensory overload, task overload, time overload. Delegation is one of those biggest things that help us or helps us to manage that influx a little bit better. And this is an example of what you could run into. You probably run into some of these things yourself. And we 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 as leaders want to fix, right? We're helpers. We want to help. We want to adjust and address the problem. But when it comes to that delegation, think about with that team that you have, think about how you can delegate those things to your team and keep track of them. And maybe even through this kind of a matrix, right? If you had that up on, you know, you had that up on your, your whiteboard or your butcher paper or a, a pad next to you, it could be a way for you to help track some of the different things that are coming through your shop, through your team um, that you have to manage. So this, this decision matrix, again, is not the end all be all. It is a tool that can help you as a meta leader manage some of this complexity. And as we talked about the dozens of relationships that we have with the, the up, down, the cross, and especially the beyond, it's a way for us to help think about how we manage which partners and when. You might be able to delegate number 11 Fire marshal needs to walk the grounds. I saw uh, a bunch of people put number 11, but there may have been some problems. Maybe you need to walk with that fire marshal, or maybe you're trying to build a strong relationship, and it's good that you have that point to point. Maybe you go with someone, and as um, Bill, Belinda, and Dave all said, it's sort of, here's my team, and maybe they're the people who can, can work with you moving forward, but you've established that relationship and built a little bit of trust. Renice was able to delegate a lot. Some of you, depending on your role and how you're thinking about this, may not have delegated a lot. There aren't any right or wrong answers. It's not like I'm going to flip to the next side and show you, you know, specifically where we are and what we have. But again, we wanted you to flex those muscles, some of those leadership muscles, some of those meta leadership muscles, and some of those delegation skills. So what we'd like to do now, um, again, we'll make sure everybody has access to these slides so you can play through it. Uh, Renice, do you have a question? Yeah, so um, in in comments to your number 11 with the state fire marshal, I wouldn't necessarily put myself out to do the walk. That would be something more facilities or grounds or like the logistics chief or someone of that caliber should go because sure. I wouldn't know if I wouldn't know looking at it that that's way above my pay grade as well as maybe somebody from DIA, from disability integration or something like that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great point, right? You don't want to be outside of your comfort zone. There's there's some times where maybe that's something you know really well, maybe you don't. And so you might not, you, you might delegate and I might not. So it's not about a right or wrong, but you just went through the thought process of being deliberate and that's what we wanted to go through. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Now we're right at, we're right at time for tonight. What we're going to do tomorrow is we're going to link our meta and our swarm leadership. And tomorrow we'll have time for questions. What we would normally do if this was uh, a single workshop is we 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 have a break and, and open up for questions right now. But we've hit time for this evening. Uh, I want to thank you for your time tonight. I want to thank you for participating. We had some fantastic things in the chat. Thank you for those who briefed and, and for those who asked questions. Um, tomorrow we're going to have a lot more interaction. We're going to have some case studies that we're going to dig into. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to be with many and hopefully all of you tomorrow and continuing this conversation in this dialogue beyond. So thank you for your time tonight, uh, this evening, wherever you are, and everybody have a wonderful restful evening. I hope to see you tomorrow. Luke, are you going to have the recording available? I had to take a DAT call in the middle. I